thanks so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you here or through Zoom. And uh, uh, I'm going to present you my research uh, on platform competition and information sharing. This is joint work uh, with Bertin Martens, uh, Google, Meta, uh, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft have replaced uh, the traditional champions, which, which uh, have been oil and uh, bank companies, uh, to, an, to a remarkable extent that uh, uh, it, it would be uh, very difficult to, to expect um, in a decade or so ago. And um, this enormous growth, this enormous success, um, to some extent, uh, relies on the special characteristics of the platform market. So platform is a special organization, a new business paradigm, uh, which has some main ingredients and characteristics. The one is uh, it is a multi-sided business. Um, in the most simplistic, uh, let's say, structure, uh, we have an intermediary in uh, the middle that uh, connects, uh, provides services that connect uh, uh, supply side and demand side. Demand wants to consume some goods and services. Supply provides these goods and services, and they meet uh, in the platform in order uh, to have an exchange. And this is uh, fundamentally different from uh, offline uh, markets. Um, uh, for example, going uh, to a flea market and open market and buy things, there we have suppliers and consumers as well. And it is fundamentally different because uh, everything happens digitally and that uh, um, uh, basically uh, brings this uh, digital interaction, three forces that they are very important for the growth of platforms. The network effects, uh, participating in a network, uh, ha a network that it is bigger and more relevant uh, to me uh, has higher value so uh, it, can be, it can bring a lot of value from being in the platform, interacting with other uh, individuals or with uh, other suppliers. Um, we have, depending on the business model, uh, we have data-driven economies of scope. Where we have an important role of data, which will be in the central, uh, po uh, the central um, theme of this talk. And we have also economies of scale that play a role. And the, the interaction of all these uh, forces, basically, uh, can create uh, big structures if they have a, a, a standalone value proposition uh, which is um, uh, important and attractive for users. Uh, once we have the kick uh, of the platform and uh, a significant amount of, of demand and supply join, uh, we have the other uh, forces, economies of scale, scope, and network effects that kick in and uh, help platforms to grow further. And uh, the fact that they have grown to an extent that cover a large part of the, um, of the economy created some concerns. And one of the concerns, an important concern that has been uh, actually uh, noted not only in US but also in other jurisdictions, is the fact that, yes, these platforms, especially the big one, generate an enormous value. But given their position in the ecosystem, given their market strategies, they keep most of this value from, the self, from themselves. And how we can distribute this value more evenly? Um, the traditional way, the way that has been proposed, is the antitrust way. Essentially, oops, uh, essentially we have um, uh, multiple antitrust proposals in the US that try, try to redistribute this value in a more even way across the platform ecosystem, in not restrict the ability of platforms to perform uh, some market strategies. Uh, and um, US is just an example that is relevant here. Europe, in fact, is more advanced and has already uh, uh, regulatory proposals and regulatory uh, uh, approved laws uh, towards this direction. So what it trust is a way, uh, a traditional way to redistribute value. Is it enough? So in this paper, we argue that probably it is not enough. And it is not enough because there is a particular challenge that hasn't been so much uh, um, discussed and that we don't have uh, so many initiatives to address it. And the challenge is that, yes, decentralized platform markets, we, uh, 
In this centralized platform market, you have centralization of information. All the information is collected by the platform intermediary. Uh, and this is used for providing value to the platform ecosystem. Uh, but that uh, generates information asymmetries. Uh, we have one platform that it, it can be super successful, but it keeps all the information for itself. It provides services based on this information, but uh, it does it in a way that it does not reveal too much information to its users and the ecosystem. And that can generate market failures. And um, this is, um, these market failures can go beyond uh, what we discussed in this paper. So this is just uh, a first paper in this line of research to explore uh, information structures in platform markets and uh, how they affect uh, economic efficiency, welfare, and business strategies. Um, it, and um, I mean, some examples have to do with the big platforms that basically, if you are talking about digital advertising, uh, they, they capitalize um, the, the unique information they have for targeted advertising services. And actually, there is a CMA report. CMA is the competition authority in UK that finds that Google and Facebook have an enormous market power in this market. And that drives the prices advertisers have to pay up. Uh, we have also the distribution of data in, uh, uh, in, um, in uh, marketplaces, online marketplaces, is dominated by Google. So we see structures that have a lot of access to information and we have many, many information, uh, information asymmetries uh, and that can generate uh, some problems. And um, why this is the case? Um, the first one is that the information has a particular uh, value and this is the first ingredient. Um, and uh, we can consider uh, two platforms, A and B. Uh, a, uh, let's say, is um, um, a very big platform like, um, I don't know, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and be a smaller competitor that does not have access to so great information and has a much smaller network. And the user's data and its aggregation, aggregation can create value, which makes platform A more attractive than platform B in the eyes of individual suppliers and uh, consumers. And this is because of the data feedback loop, uh, which is basically better, the first ingredient is better information leads to better products and services at the intermediary level of the platform. But it is also, it can help to create better algorithms because this data is used as a training data set for the algorithm. So having greater quality variety uh, of data can help the algorithms to become better and therefore uh, it uh, raises a gap between uh, platform A and uh, platform B in the product market in the intermediary level exactly because of this data symmetry. Of course, this is great news for platform A. We have a very successful example of business. Uh, we have some big platforms that they are uh, super successful and bring a lot of value. So what is the problem? What are the market failures? And this is exactly the points of our series of papers. And here I will focus on the one of these market failures, which is called data bottleneck market failure. Um, what is this? So by having uh, a super successful platform that has a lot of information, which generates a lot of value, because data is transformed to value through the data feedback, uh, feedback loop I presented in the previous slide. Um, the question is how, this how much of this value goes to the users of the platform and how much of this value goes to the platform itself. And uh, in a game theoretic model uh, we developed, we saw that the platform, the big platform, the platform with the information advantage, has always uh, an incentive uh, to use its data advantage to its benefit. So what does this mean? Uh, I, de I develop a very a great value to consumers and uh, sellers. More consumers want to join me. That means that more sellers want to join me. They have higher value from uh, joining me. And because I have monopolized the demand side, I'm able to charge a very high price to the supply side. So I can extract all the rents, all the surplus, all the value from the sellers by monopolizing the demand side because 
I have unique access to information that creates network value. And this is the, the data bottleneck market failure and says, in a sense, that the platform can get more, the most of the value it creates by monopolizing the unique insights and data it has. So this is what we illustrate in our paper. And then we are um, discussing what could be a solution to this market failure. So this is a theory of harm, something that can happen in platform markets that, that we have high information asymmetry between uh, competing platforms. So how, what is, uh, how we can solve this problem? Uh, how we can um, achieve better value uh, uh, redistribution of um, uh, the, immense, the great value we have in this ecosystem? And um, the idea and the approach that we believe is the most promising is uh, to create more symmetric information structures between platforms. So, yes, um, the big platform can still have uh, a great infrastructure, uh, it can have uh, a great success, but uh, the, the question is how it can reduce the information asymmetry with competing platforms so that competing platforms can be more competitive in the market and resolve in this way the data bottleneck market failure. The data bottleneck market failure can be solved by increasing competition. But for this, US antitrust proposals will, not, will only have a limited effect. We need more structural solutions. We need to create more symmetric information structures. And in this way, we can create more competition at the platform level. And more competition means that the platform that had before the data advantage will not have any more the ability to, um, to withhold uh, a, dispro a disproportionately high value uh, of, uh, that it is created in this ecosystem. So your competition policy approach should be complemented with an efficient data policy that facilitates more information um, uh, structures. And one way to achieve this is data sharing. And in fact, yeah, please. Yeah, just to, to ask a question to make sure I understand. Can you, can you explain why this argument does not apply to like a non-platform business that also collects data on its users? Yes. Um, so because here, the, the market failure, the data market failure is based on the fact that we have multi-sided uh, multiple sites that they are interconnected. What does it mean? It means that by having access to a lot of information, I can provide a lot of value uh, to the one side, consumers, and I can monetize my business on the other side, the sellers. So this, uh, in a traditional setting, in a traditional firm that we don't have multiple sites, you don't have this uh, rise of this market failure. You need the multiple sides that they are interconnected in order to uh, information monopoly leads to demand monopoly. And that means high price on the supply side. So you need multiple sides for this market failure to be relevant and emerge in equilibrium. Thanks. And maybe to follow up. Should we think of this high, <clears throat> high price to the sellers as a transfer, or is there also like an efficiency loss uh, from this? Um, so it is, it is actually, uh, it can be actually both in the sense, it is certainly a transfer and this price can be, can take many forms. It can be a participation fee in the platform. It can be a per transaction fee that the platform collects. Uh, and um, it, it can also, uh, and that leads to inefficiency exactly because uh, the consumer side also uh, is hurt by that. So I, I extract all the surplus from the seller side, uh, but that means uh, that because of information asymmetry, also consumers are worse off. And we will provide uh, some insight on how consumers are also hurt by this uh, in the model. Uh, but um, uh, we have this efficiency loss, we have lower consumer welfare, and that is the point, how we can, uh, creating more symmetric uh, uh, structures can create more efficiency uh, at, the, uh, at the overall level. Uh, if we are talking about the platform that um, uh, is the dominant one, that has the information advantage, um, under this structure, has, 
ha having the monopoly of information uh, will provide very, uh, very efficient services, but this is only one part of the market. There are much more that we need to consider. Any further question, please? Uh, are you absolutely sure that it's an uh, information um, discrepancy between uh, platforms versus uh, not having a layer of trust? And I'll try to explain on a very simple example quick, quickly. If you got an email right now that the jacket that you're wearing is available from Nigeria for a dollar, you just throw it away because you don't trust it. It will probably never come. It's a you know, fishing expedition. But if you knew for sure that whoever is contacting you will never get the dollar until you have the jacket in your hands. It would illuminate it. The same thing with the, um, uh, let's say, ride sharing services. There is no rhyme or reason the platform should make more money than the driver. So if you were able to put, the, for, for people who are able to put it uh, in, in, in advance to some degree, you know, 15 minutes or 15 hours or 15 days, they can throw on the platforms that I want to ride from MIT to Logan, and I'm willing to pay so much and so much. And, you know, people can submit whoever wants to. So it's not necessary. To me, maybe information is a precursor to trust, but it's not necessary. Yeah, I think trust in general is a very important dimension of online commerce in general. And uh, certainly we should ensure transparency and trust in all transactions. So, the idea here is um, having, having established some trust, at least from the major platforms in the economy. Uh, how we will be able to redistribute the value given the, uh, that the trust is guaranteed at this level. So we don't say that um, uh, we should um, open the door and have multiple uh, providers and firms and platforms uh, some of which uh, may uh, have questionable practices with, with respect to trust. We, uh, but we are far away from this stage, actually. We are in the stage that we have some five, six super big platforms and uh, a handful of competitors in these markets that they have, um, to some extent, um, uh, have uh, high trust standards. The problem is they don't have the means to provide better services. Uh, and uh, yeah, we can discuss further that as we go or after the talk, but thanks. Trust is an important issue. So um, the question is how to achieve more symmetric information structures. Uh, uh, so how we can um, remove this data bottleneck to create more competition and more efficient markets. And um, I mean, we, we had some inspiration uh, for moving forward. And we think that, that uh, the EU regulatory intervention moves to the correct uh, uh, direction, um, uh, but uh, probably the terms uh, it, uh, it includes at the current stage, it's the new law, the European uh, Digital Markets Act, are very vague, and we want to provide some guidance over the terms uh, for uh, this regulation on how it should be implemented. And basically, if we focus on personal data, towards the end, I will discuss also about personal data, which is a much more complicated issue for facilitating data sharing and in order to reduce information asymmetries. Uh, the new regulation in Europe obliges Google to provide uh, to its competitor in online search um, access to ranking, query, click, and view data. Um, this data is, to some extent, uh, aggregated because it should be anonymized. Uh, and, um, this um, access should be provided at fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. And, okay, this is a little bit vague because essentially we want to discuss how much data should be shared, what is the optimal from the social point of view, what should be the price that a platform like Google should receive in order to share this information with, with uh, its competitor in online search. Why uh, to consider only online search? What about other, um, uh, other categories of platform and services like online marketplaces, social media. What do we have here? Why not to have uh, such forms of rules for these other categories of platforms, but we only focus on online service? And uh, so that is the second objective of the paper. The first is to illustrate that, you know, guys, 
If we have information asymmetry, there can be a market failure, the data bottleneck market failure. And if we use uh, the new approach in Europe that moves to the correct direction, how we can answer these questions? How we should design this data sharing mechanism from the big platform to competitors in order to get the most social benefits out of that? So this is basically uh, the, uh, the objectives and the motivation of the talk. And um, uh, I can start uh, illustrating a little bit the model. I will try to keep uh, this talk uh, as uh, not so technical. I will provide some equations, but I will, be, I will give focus on the intuition. Are there any further questions at the current stage? OK, cool. So um, we consider a big platform A uh, that competes with a smaller platform B which are located at the extremes of a linear city. And I will provide a graph to explain uh, clearer what I mean. Uh, platforms uh, have uh, as an objective to match consumers with sellers uh, for uh, 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 the sellers of goods and services. Uh, so the consumers and the sellers decide whether they join platform A or platform B or both, uh, and sellers do uh, the same decisions. And they, they have a mass of one distributed uniformly across the line, and consumers incur a transportation cost to arrive to the platform. So um, consumers are between zero and one. Uh, platforms uh, are at points zero and one. So the farther I am from the point of the platform, um, the higher transportation cost I incur to arrive to the platform. And this, is, this gives a flavor of preferences and how, how my preferences, my personal preferences as a consumer differ uh, from the service of the platform and what, uh, uh, what the value I get from the platform. Um, so um, if um, I'm more into uh, socializing with my friends in an informal environment, I probably my preferences are closer to meta. Uh, if I want to have interaction with colleagues and potential employers, uh, my preferences are closer to LinkedIn. Uh, so we have some competition between Meta, Facebook platform, and uh, LinkedIn, uh, but um, uh, this competition, are not, they, are, they don't provide exactly the same service, the same product. They are different. There are different dimensions, and it depends on my preferences, who, whether I'm closer to the one platform or the other. Um, and platforms, they have uh, zero marginal cost of operation, uh, and uh, basically, um, the important point is uh, this value me uh, of uh, consumer C at platform J. Uh, and um, this is the network of value the consumer, the per agent uh, network of value the consumer uh, uh, derives by interacting with side K. And side K uh, is uh, either consumer, so it's same side network effects. I'm in a Facebook platform. Um, I mostly get value by interacting with uh, my friends and other individuals. Um, or it could be uh, a seller, uh, a supplier of a good or service. Uh, I'm in a, uh, Amazon. I derive more, more value by interacting with the sellers and buy some products. So it depends on the platform category uh, on uh, which, uh, the, which of the network effects, the same side or cross side, will be important. And on the seller side, you have the same value. They derive value by interacting with consumers. We don't have same side network effect here, but the story would have been very similar. But the key is that this value depends on the amount of information Q that platform J has. Uh, and um, uh, the higher uh, the information I have, the higher is the network value I can provide to the user join my platform, either on the supply side or the demand. And, uh, the platforms differ with respect to information. So we have information asymmetry. The information of platform A is a distinct data set from the one of platform B, uh, and it is much greater uh, and of much better quality. And uh, let's go into the utilities. Uh, the, the platform set price uh, enterprise, uh, that could also be interpreted per transaction cost. Um, the economic analysis here would, would have been exactly the same. The consumer gets value by interacting with the other consumers who join the platform, uh, by interacting with uh, the sellers that join uh, the platform. 
but uh, probably the platform uh, does not much exact their preferences. Facebook versus LinkedIn, they have uh, to cover a distance to arrive to the platform, uh, and that has some cost. And on the seller side, we have the value they, um, they generate uh, um, by interacting with consumers, uh, which depends on the information, uh, as we said, minus the price they have to pay uh, to join the platform. Yes. Uh, so, is, so let's say like on Twitter or, or Instagram, it, so the consumer is, is like me looking at the pictures, right? And is the seller like the advertisers or yes. the people who post? So in, the, in a platform like Instagram or more generally in social media, what we expect in consumer side, this term to be the most important. Uh, this term will, probably will not be so important, but the sellers here are exactly the advertisers. The ads you see to interact with the supply side, they supply some good services, they, they show you targeted ads, and this is the way sellers interact with you. So for sellers, the, the value they get by interacting with consumer will still be high, but probably here it will be the value of interacting with other users higher than the, the value from interacting with sellers. Yeah. Maybe a related question. On the previous slide, you have um, this assumption about uh, the network value is increasing with Q. Like, I wonder, in what settings is this reasonable? In what settings is this maybe more um, contentious of an assumption? So like in, in the example you gave, my understanding is this would assume that more targeted advertising is better for consumers. Is that reasonable or uh, should I have a mistake? So yeah, uh, so the idea here is that um, uh, I can always, by having more information, and this is something related also to the data feedback loop I, relay, um, I described uh, uh, before, I have better algorithms to make the match uh, between consumers with each other and consumers with sellers. Uh, and uh, I also can provide more tailored uh, uh, services to each of my users. Uh, so exactly, so for a social media platform, would be uh, I see more relevant content. If I have, for example, uh, many friends, uh, they will not only uh, they will not only fit in my newsfeed. I want to see the most relevant content. If I'm interested, for example, since we talk about Twitter on a particular research project, and I see I, and I see uh, researchers that work on this project that uh, that uh, post some interesting research. This is exactly because uh, the platform has um, an efficient level of information that can generate this much, right? And in Twitter, for example, you don't see only your connected uh, people, you see also people uh, that you are not connected, you don't follow, but it is very relevant uh, to what, uh, uh, to your interest. So by browsing uh, on the platform, by interacting with the other uh, users, you create interact uh, interaction data points, and these data points uh, can generate uh, a better profiling for the platform in order to provide more personalized services that has more value for you. And the same applies um, to, uh, to the supply side. As I said, um, in a social media example, probably this value is small in general and can increase a little bit with, um, um, with um, uh, information to an extent that you see probably a relevant event that takes place in your city and you are interested. Um, in the case of e-commerce, it will be this is the primary source of uh, uh, value uh, where, uh, again, the information can generate uh, uh, more relevant products for you as a consumer. So, yeah, it's more general that uh, information brings more value. And we have, um, I mean, in the paper, we refer also to information systems literature and economics literature that show a different context, a different, uh, through different examples, how value can improve um, uh, the services of, of platforms and firms in general, not only platforms, yeah. One, uh, I guess, related question is if the firm is using this data to price discriminate, is that captured in this model or would that be an instance where the utility is declining in the data that's collected? So um, there can be an extension of this model that we have, um, no, actually, this model uh, assumes a uniform price uh, for everyone, uh, right. which is more suitable 
uh, to, um, uh, to big tech business models. So in big tech business models, which uh, was also the, uh, the motivation here uh, to study this, because there we observe the high information asymmetries, we basically have uniform prices and probably we have some additional relevant products that they are priced more, but more or less it's uh, a given price uh, and uh, you select uh, the choices, probably you bundle different goods because they are multi-product uh, multi-service uh, firms as well. But uh, since we don't observe price discrimination, at least at Big Tech, because and having I have talked with people at Big Tech, they don't do that exactly because there is a negative perception of price discriminations and they are worrying about uh, the reputation damages. Uh, in the business models, we see more uniform prices. So it does not extend uh, to other cases that probably price discrimination can arise. It's mostly a Big Tech story and information asymmetries. Yes. So how do you think about this price versus like the auction prices of the advertisers that they get from Facebook? Is it a separate price or is it, it is analogous to that? Um, no, this is uh, exactly um, for a keyword um, uh, for Facebook. Um, you have many um, people uh, participating in the auction. It's a second price auction. So basically you have a, an equilibrium price. And all, the, all the, the advertisers that bid uh, uh, beyond that price, uh, above this price, they have to pay that particular price. So you don't have price discrimination in this sense. But uh, this is, let's say, uh, the, the price that the platforms find optimal to charge the sellers. And uh, whether they do that with a fixed price or an auction is how you implement the optimal price. So basically, an auction is one way to implement my op optimal price schedule. Uh, a fixed price could be another uh, way to implement uh, the uh, fixed price schedule. Here we have a more macroscopic approach. We, we don't go to, uh, to the exact mechanism which uh, facilitates this um, uh, charge of the price. We say this is the price can be implemented in various mechanics. So it's one step uh, behind because the exact mechanics does not play any role for the findings of the study. It's more general. It can be an auction. Um, it can be um, uh, per transaction fee, as I said, which is more relevant to e-commerce platforms. Um, an auction, which is more relevant to uh, online advertising. A fixed price, that it is uh, probably, um, uh, it can be also relevant to some uh, platforms as well. So uh, the exact mechanics of setting the price does not matter so much is what is the level of the price that I find optimal to charge. Yeah. Um, and so in order to be, a, so the, and this is the last uh, real modeling slide, then we'll go back uh, to intuition and results uh, and graphical illustration actually of the results. Um, so uh, the, in order to be able to uh, set the, the optimal price, um, the, the platforms, uh, they, should, uh, ha, uh, they should get, uh, 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 they know the demand function. And the demand function in this model uh, is uh, determined by the marginal consumers, uh, the, the consumer that will get uh, overall uh, utility uh, zero by joining the platform. And by doing that, uh, basically, we find the marginal users, which is also relevant for the demand that each platform faces. And what we see is that the demand of platform uh, A is proportional to the amount of information it has. So, and um, this is increasing in the amount of information it has. Uh, this is increasing, this is decreasing, the numerator is decreasing. In, uh, decreasing. So this goes up with QA. Uh, the opposite holds for uh, XB, which is the demand of platform B, which is declining um, uh, in uh, QB, but uh, this is because um, uh, Q, uh, platform B is based at one uh, and the other is at zero. Uh, so essentially, uh, the, the, uh, the demand for platform B is again increasing in QB. Um, and before I will, uh, let me show that also in the graph in, um, uh, in the next slide, but before that, uh, let me also uh, mention how we model information sharing. We have two key parameters of interest that we want uh, to uh, find the social optimal value. It is the Q, the amount of data that I ask the big platform A to share uh, with platform B. 
and the parameter alpha. How this, plot, uh, this parameter alpha is defined is basically it deter determines the price that platform A will receive from platform B. Uh, platform, uh, this alpha is one if we are in the unregulated case, if information sharing is uh, an initiative of the platform itself, but it can be lower than uh, one uh, if um, uh, uh, there is a price regulation uh, in the, uh, the set information sharing times. So if um, alpha equals one, platform A is able to extract all the value from platform B, uh, that, uh, that uh, all the value from information sharing, the additional information the platform B receives. If alpha is uh, lower than one, we have um, the benefits of information sharing as shared between the two firms. And the question is, what is the optimal way to share these benefits uh, between the two platforms? What is the optimal alpha, which basically means what is the optimal price of information? So what do we want? Uh, the ultimate goal, and we will arrive there, is to determine what is the optimal amount to share and what is the optimal amount um, uh, to, uh, what is the optimal price? But be before going that, uh, let's see what we have in uh, equilibrium in case that no information sharing takes place. So what we have is that uh, QA is greater than QB. So XA is here, XB is there. Um, that means that uh, all the consumer to the left of XA uh, bar goes to platform I, single home to platform I. All consumers to the right of platform B goes to platform B. It's a smaller demand because um, smaller a, a firm a, uh, a platform A has the information advantage. And we also have some excluded consumers. We could consider also different, in the paper, we consider different settings, but the intuition of information sharing and its implications are, is exactly the same. So I will stay with this example here. So what is the issue here? is that uh, platform A has monopoly over this segment of the demand uh, between zero and XA bar. The valuation of sellers to join this uh, platform A is uh, the value they get by interacting by this amount of, uh, by this number of consumers. So at, uh, in equilibrium, platform A, because has a monopoly over this demand, finds optimal to charge a price to seller that equals the value they derive from joining platform A. So essentially, and this is a data bottleneck, I find optimal to extract all the rents that the sellers can get from my platform, all the value that they get. So in the end, sellers join the platform to interact with consumers, but they have zero value out of that because all the value is captured by the platform because of this monopoly information uh, High information advantage leads to um, uh, a higher uh, segment of demand that is monopolized by platform A. Uh, and this is the equilibrium, uh, the data bottleneck, uh, the illustration, how it are, uh, uh, we arrive in this equilibrium. And the question is now, uh, let us assume that we have information sharing Q. As we said, XB is decreasing um, in Q, so uh, in QB and Q. So by increasing the amount of Q platform uh, uh, B has, uh, this uh, animal here, XB bar, moves to the left. That means now that the monopoly over the demand of platform A has decreased because um, platform B now gets uh, access to more information, they can provide more efficient services, and therefore uh, uh, more users are attracted to platform B and that increased competition to platform A. Yeah. Are sellers allowed to also multi-home or if? Of course, the sellers to are also allowed to multi-home. I see. Okay. Uh, and um, in this uh, model, they don't, uh, the, the transportation cost is uh, on the consumer side mostly. So consumers uh, pay some cost to go to a, a platform A uh, and B. For simplicity, we assume that uh, sellers do not have any uh, transportation cost, but um, it is easy. It is easy to extend the main arguments of the model and uh, the effects of information sharing by having a more symmetric treatment and allowing also the sellers to uh, to incur some transportation cost. But the multi-home, uh, the fact, in fact, uh, we have more multi-homing in the seller, seller side because we don't have this transportation cost. But uh, on the 
demand side, which is the important side for uh, getting the monopoly rights over the sellers, now uh, the monopoly that I have as platform A, it's much smaller because only uh, the guys uh, to the left of uh, XB bar uh, go only to platform A. Between XB bar and XA bar, consumers multi home in both platforms. So, uh, and um, uh, to the right of XA bar now, uh, all, uh, we have a single homing to uh, side B. And what does it mean essentially? Uh, it's that the power platform A had on um, before has been reduced and so did the amount it can extract in equilibrium from the seller. Uh, from the seller. So now uh, it, uh, this XB bar QB plus Q, it's much smaller than QA bar. So now they can extract a lower amount from the sellers uh, and uh, exactly because we have more multi-homing on the consumer side. Uh, sellers generate some positive value now by joining the platforms uh, and consumers, the, the, there is no any segment of consumers that they are excluded. All consumers are treated. Some of them, they get value from both platforms because they multi-home. The ones that they are in the more central area between XB bar and XA bar and therefore the welfare of use sellers and consumers have improved because of information sharing. The profitability of platform B has improved as well. It became more competitive. Of course, we don't have the Pareto improvement. We have one loser that it is a big platform, but we have more efficient information sharing and not a data bottleneck market failure anymore in the market. So that is the first part of the story. Um, and uh, the question then is, if we can arrive to this situation without regulation, and for this, we need to compare the social and the private incentives uh, for information sharing. So the social planner uh, cares primarily from consumer, for consumer welfare and business user payoff. For example, in the European regulation uh, on platforms, the Digital Markets Act, the main objective is to give uh, to consumers more consumer choice, to be able to visit alternative uh, platform providers, to be able to interact with more sellers, which brings also some more value to the sellers because they don't have uh, to go through a gatekeeper to interact with the demand, but they can interact with the demand with multiple choices. So this is consistent with the objective of the regulators in this space. And um, what uh, information sharing has two effects on the platform A's, uh, payoff. Uh, in the direct market loses due to increased competition. Yeah, please. So the business user payoff includes the platform payoff, or is it different here? Because like it should be consumer welfare plus business user payoff plus platform payoff. Uh, so payoff? it the platform payoff, the platform A's uh, payoff is excluded here, because uh, then we would have gone to more to the total welfare consideration. But the way the regulator uh, reacts is uh, to prioritize consumer welfare. Right. And in platform markets, because we have multiple sites, here we have two sites, uh, what um, is the extension of the consumer welfare uh, consideration here is I consider all the users of the platform on the demand and the consumer side. So this is the primary objective for the regulator and our social planner here. I see. So the, the social planner here is not the traditional social planner cares about total welfare. It's more about the regulator cares about uh, protection. More, uh, it is more the... Yeah, it's more the, uh, the social planner who cares about uh, the, uh, the implications of platform regulation on the welfare. And this regulator put more emphasis to a consumer demand, the user, uh, user welfare in this case. But it's a kind of factual where if the social planner cares too much about these two elements, ends up destroying the platform that they end up getting basically it's a counterfactual zero payoff, right? Like that, that should be in consideration as well. Like if the platform is just being squeezed and the size is no longer feasible to make, remain in business, then the consumer and the business users are also going to be affected in the exactly. factual world of not having a platform. Exactly. Okay. So in the dynamic sense, uh, the, platform, uh, uh, the platform welfare is taken into account. So this is a static model, a model which uh, collapses in one time in also these dynamic effects. And the, uh, the argument here is that by having platform be more competitive and more profitable, we have also consumers and business users uh, better off. 
And certainly we cannot, um, we don't analyze the case that um, platform A will go out of the market because this is far, farther away from what we have today. We have a dominant platform that it is very hard to consider it going outside the market. So yeah, it loses some uh, of uh, its value. By the way, the value it loses, it, it is gained for platform B. So even if you go to the total welfare consideration, you, by summing the two platforms, uh, you get a zero in terms of changes of welfare. So even in the total, uh, uh, total uh, welfare consideration would be again in a sense consumer and business user, the users of the platforms and what benefits they get by the increased competition. Because the gains uh, of platform B are the losses of platform A. So yeah, you are right uh, that um, in this setting, total welfare and consumer welfare in the broad sense on the platform ecosystems are totally aligned. Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, please. So, does that, uh, does like the welfare of A going straight to welfare of B, does that assume, does it have to assume like linear uh, value of information? Or? Um, so the, the profit of A goes to platform B, but uh, for this platform B has to pay some price to platform A. So it is that I lose market, uh, and then this is more or less, I mean, we don't specify functions, but it is a linear transfer, more or less. We, that, that could be uh, how we could interpret it. But we have, in addition, the payment. Um, let me go a few slides below. We have this payment here, uh, which is uh, uh, paid by platform B to platform A. And that is an additional source uh, of uh, income for platform A, uh, given uh, uh, the information. Sorry, oops, I'm going back. Sorry. Uh, so, what uh, are the implications of information sharing? On ah, sorry, sorry. Please. One more question on this measure of welfare. You mentioned that this measure is aligned with total welfare, uh, if I understood correctly. But we also talked about how a transfer from the platform to sellers is like an important mechanism. It seems like those two measures might be in like, from total efforts perspective, that would be just a transfer. We wouldn't care. But from this perspective, I think that would be a negative. Is that right? Uh, yes. So here, what we have is an increase of payoff for platform B. That means that platform B will also charge higher price to sellers. Correct. And decrease of the price platform A. Uh, charge to sellers and uh, exactly because we have the increase of the price on the one side and the decrease on the other uh, this affects uh, if we want to consider total uh, welfare they cancel out to some extent uh, and um, what it remains is the benefit of the business users because now they don't have to pay the monopoly price we have this share of multi-homing and the prices they pay it, platform B may charge higher price uh, but still, uh, uh, business users make some positive rent. So, yes, you are right to the extent that um, platform A uh, now, um, some of the value of the platform A transferred to the business users, but the platform B gets also some value from the business users now. But overall, business users are better off than before. Okay. Thanks. So, um, so, the point here is... Uh, the information sharing has two effects on platform A, the platform that shares information. It is, uh, oh, sorry. It is uh, the direct market losses by increased competition, by making platform B more efficiently, and um, information sharing payment, which is a positive uh, impact, um, has a positive impact, uh, and uh, that means that uh, platform A gains. But if we analyze the, the objective function and compare it to the social planner, I try to uh, use the pointer, but yeah, OK. No, OK, I will not use the pointer. Uh, so uh, the social incentives dominate private ones. So there is a scope for a mandatory uh, data sharing policy. Uh, and um, the question is, what should be the optimal Q and the optimal alpha? The optimal amount and the optimal uh, price, uh, let's say, uh, that we should consider in this regulatory approach, in this mandatory scheme. I will skip the technical details. Uh, we also consider the implications of um, the data sharing uh, 
mandatory policy on the incentives of the platform A to invest and analyze data. Uh, and once you implement an information sharing scheme, uh, the platform A has less incentives to collect and analyze data, which could uh, increase its network value. So this negative effect goes directly to welfare and should be taken into account. Uh, and the social optimal data policy is the one that you should not allow platform A to get any benefit for information sharing. Uh, and uh, the amount Q is such that the distance between XB and XA uh, bars are maximized. Uh, the issue here is that XA may go a little bit to the left because exactly uh, information sharing reduce the incentives of platform A to invest on data. Uh, so uh, the amount of information it collects and analyzes will be smaller. But at the same time, we have the positive impact on platform B's uh, um, value. And therefore, we need to balance the two, uh, two values where this X uh, A bar minus X B is maximized. We have the optimal amount. And the, but the price should be zero. And the price should be zero for the following reason. And that was a surprising result when we find it. Uh, by not allowing platform A to capture any benefit, monetary benefit for information sharing, it, you, you basically say to platform A, dude, you should go to the market, improve your network value, be more competitive in order to get some profits. So that means that the platform A will have more incentives at, at the zero price to invest on data and improve its network value. And in this way, it mitigate, mitigate the the negative effect of information sharing on this data investment. So this is the optimal arrangement of these two dimensional policies. And uh, would the, then the, this amount Q in equilibrium be uh, sufficient and significant? Um, yes, when data exhibits diminishing returns to scale, that means the value that Q brings to the network value. Yes, when we have an S-based relationship, not so much, if we have increasing returns to scale, then probably data the optimal data sharing should not be will not be significant. Uh, I mean, according to uh, empirical uh, literature and also some uh, people that they have unique insights in the industry, like Hal Varian, we are in the case of diminishing returns to scale. Some other papers are UNS based relationship. So the increasing returns to scale are not so much in the picture according to empirical. Yeah. So in this world of data sharing, are you saying, as an example, right, is it like, you know, a competing platform to LinkedIn comes in and they want to get as many users as they can, are you then mandating LinkedIn to just share the entire network of users to this competing platform? Or are you saying that, like, they can hold LinkedIn's API uh, and then, you know, sign up more quickly to LinkedIn's API? Like, from the user's perspective, why is it that the sharing moves the X bar B? so far to the left because that seems like a user pre you, you were talking about user preferences really right like the distance between yeah the, the, so the two i guys. guess that depends on the type of data of sharing mm -hmm. so if we go uh to the non-personal data then we are talking about aggregated non-personal data uh, that uh, basically uh, uh transfer some network value from the big platform from google as the european regulation to competitor search engines. So that ranking query click uh, view data. And Google is obliged, according to this rule, to share this data. Now, we didn't know about the amount. We answered how much amount should be paid, uh, should be um, shared. There is empirical evidence that in online search we have the S-based approach, so still it will be significant, but it should not be excessive because then uh, welfare is not maximized, social welfare at least. And, uh, uh, on the, at, uh, and we answered the price. So it's more, uh, any information that confers, uh, contains network value, and that should be shared. And it is not, um, uh, you don't need to design your own API. Uh, that will come, I guess, from the regulation for the other uh, platforms to access Google's data and such kind of non-personal data. But it is exactly by making another search engine, uh, by getting more information, provide more efficient services, more, more value for consumers, that it is the resulting competition that generates the benefits. I see. So basically, this like LinkedIn competitor would need to be able to improve its services through non-personal data share, 
and that would then move the X bar B to the left. Like, like the X bar B is like basically yeah. the consumer evaluation. The, of the question is if in the social media space, mm -hmm. non-personal data can be very uh, right. really important. Uh, so for online search, it is. For marketplaces, it is. So I don't see any argument to keep this only in online search. But if we go uh, to uh, personal data, then the situation is more complicated. Then we have the obligations that the end user, an individual, a consumer, a social media user, has the right, free of charge, uh, to port uh, their data from LinkedIn to another social media platform, or to another platform in general. So there's a better example here than maybe Bing, Bing versus Google. So let's say Bing just got all of Google's secret sauce of how to improve search that are not personal data related. And then Bing became as, a, as good as Google, and that would start yeah, attracting more users. Because that's sort of like so I think that is an excellent empirical question. The empirical, the empirical evidence that we have uh, are not so much about data setting. It's about the value the data has for uh, the value proposition of a platform or a firm. And then we see a clearly positive relationship. The second order effects, uh, there are also some effects for the second order effects that point to diminishing returns or S-based approach. But, uh, uh, so, but based on that, more, getting more data from your competitor that it is market relevant, I guess that will also bring some benefits uh, since data is a valuable asset for providing platform services. Um, we are almost out of time. Um, so personal data is more complicated uh, um, space. We have some ideas. Happy to discuss insights if you have time, but uh, don't feel obliged to stay longer. Thanks so much for your feedback and your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I feel like one of the beautiful things about research is that getting answers only leads to more questions. Yeah. Can you share any of the questions that are sort of like outstanding from your mind after finishing this? Yes. And we just touched the question that I think it's important. So the one is uh, assessing the relationship between data and network value, which is basically an empirical uh, question that should be priority. But the second question is how we can share personal data, how we can empower users with more control over their data. Uh, and this is something, uh, a very difficult thing to do, especially in social media platforms, which is actually more important. And this is because data points are co-generated. Different user individuals interact. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very hard to assign in this interaction data point um, uh, property rights. Let me give you an example uh, that I hope will make it clear. So let's consider Eileen and Karen, the, the people, this, uh, be, be, two of the people behind of this uh, uh, ID lunch seminar that ran in such an efficient way. And uh, Eileen posts in social media, I love the hot chocolate at the MIT Sloan Carrie Kari responds, me too. Now, Kari, according, we're talking about personal data, according to privacy rules, is not able to, uh, to share this preference of hers with another platform. And why is that? Because the context that defines the preference is at Eileen's post. It's personal data of Eileen. So I think one of the most important uh, priorities is to design a mechanism that can uh, allow individuals to have more control over their data and to share their data, given these privacy rules. And I believe in privacy. I think it's a fundamental, uh, a fundamental right of people. Uh, so by keeping uh, the privacy rules as they are, can we find a mechanism so that Kari will be enabled to share her information <coughs> with other platforms? And I think that is the big question. And we have some ideas out how to achieve it. Not full, uh, full description of the mechanics, but probably the beginning of a very hard problem to solve. So uh, that would be the question uh, I find fascinating to work on. Thanks. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you again, Yorgos. Great job. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it.